Good afternoon, everyone. I'll give you a second and then we'll just get started. All right. So folks will continue to come into the room, but we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I want to welcome you to this month's Justice and Public Health event. My name is Lauren Jones. I use she, her, and hers pronouns, and I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built within the traditional homelands um, of the Dakota people. Minnesota comes from the Dakota name for this region, Minnesota Makoche, which loosely translates to the land where the waters reflect the skies. Um, we're gonna be sharing some concrete resources for you to support our indigenous relatives in the chat very shortly. I also want to point out that closed captioning is available for anyone who needs it. You can access that by using the icon in the bottom right corner of your screen. You can also reach out to Sarah Harris, who's providing our tech support today via the chat to ask questions about accessibility. We'll monitor the chat for questions as well as share links to our valuation and information about future justice and public events, as well as one other event. The Justice in Public Health series was started in 2021 as part of the School of Public Health's commitment to justice and anti-racism. We've been hosting monthly events with local and national experts around topics of public health. The speakers and presentations in the series help to ground us in theory and practice, as well as complement the classroom learning that our students experience. We also hope that today's discussion is part of a broader change happening outside of the School of Public Health. If you're interested in staying abreast of other Justice and Public Health events, please be sure to fill out our event evaluation after this. It'll be in the chat um, and check the box to receive notifications about upcoming events. You can also visit our website at any time. This event will be recorded and available on our website. Now I want to welcome our speaker for today. Dr. Kushnud is an Associate Professor and Faculty Director for Humanitarian Research Lab um, at Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Kushnud is trained as an infectious disease epidemiologist and has more than three decades of domestic and international experience in HIV prevention research among people who use drugs and other at-risk populations. Dr. Kushnud's research interests include epidemiology and prevention of HIV AIDS, research ethics, and humanitarian health. Uh, and without further ado, I will pass it to Dr. Kushnu. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, as you can see, the title uh, of my talk today is Health in Humanitarian Crisis and What is the Role of Public Health Academician? This is something that I've been thinking about myself for years and years, and I have some experience to share with you. And of course, I would be very interested in your um, thoughts as well. So as you heard, my background is infectious disease epidemiology. And the first thing I did as part of my PhD was um, working on needle exchange program, which was kind of a uh, kind of controversial issue that was uh, being proposed in New Haven, uh, city of New Haven, Connecticut. And um, what was really impactful for that was that when we, we developed like a one-year evaluation project on the syringe exchange program in New Haven, and after we released it, which showed HIV AIDS is going down among people who have access to syringes by what, 33%, and there's no increase in drug use, within a year, policymakers changed the law and inc uh, increased access to syringes over the counter. And frankly, that, that experience was very impactful and meaningful for me, and it kind of stayed with me. I'm interested in doing research, which can translate into some uh, sort of policy and practice. Uh, I did get interested in ethics of HIV AIDS research, because clearly when you're working with very vulnerable population, ethical issues come up. And then lastly, my focus has become health of populations that are affected by 
humanitarian crisis. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about today. <clears throat> and my interest in humanitarian health is quite personal. Um, I was actually born in Iran. And when I was a young teenager, experienced a lot of political violence. And there was a horrific a war between Iran and neighboring country of Iraq between 1980 and 1990, 1988. Over a million people died from both sides. Uh, so that was a disaster. I left the country and I was fortunate enough to be able to come to the United States, finish my high school and et cetera. Uh, and frankly, I tried to forget about uh, that horrific thing that happened. But um, as I started in school of public health, Unfortunately, I kept seeing other wars are happening in the Middle East region and other regions. And this question kept coming up for me. What is my role as a public health academician? What can I do in response to um, these conflicts? So this is an outline for my uh, conversation with you today. I wanna give you a, just a broad overview of health and humanitarian crisis, focus on role of academicians, particularly doing relevant research and also policy advocacy. And finally, I wanna give you a brief overview of the Humanitarian Research Lab, which I launched in 2021, and tell you a little bit about our projects. So in terms of overview, um, humanitarian crisis, there's multiple definitions. It's basically either one event or a series of events that brings a major threat not just to the health, but the safety, security, and well-being of communities or a large population uh, in one country or multiple countries. Usually, when we think about humanitarian crisis, we put it on two buckets. One is uh, climate-related crisis, and the other one is armed conflict. Um, by the end of 2023, as you can see, over a, close to 120 million people were forcibly displaced because of what was happening in their country, persecution, conflict, violence, human rights violation. And over 26 million people were displaced because of weather related and geophysical disasters. So it's definitely impacting a lot of people. When we think about what is the impact of armed conflict on health, um, there are multiple categories we need to be thinking about. There's definitely gonna be some direct impact uh, which we can talk about. The direct impact is sort of what happens basically within seconds, minutes, days uh, of armed conflict. Clearly, there's going to be a lot of deaths. There's going to be a lot of physical injuries. It's often referred to as bullets and bombs. There's definitely going to be a lot of mental health trauma for people who go through this, their family members, et cetera. Unfortunately, sexual violence is becoming a major issue in armed conflict. Many of the uh, you know, armed groups use sexual violence. And of course, displacement. Um, pretty quickly, a lot of the populations feel like they are not safe and they need to, to leave, uh, whether they go internally or leave the country. So these are kind of direct uh, impacts of conflict on health. But when we think about indirect, and by the way, some of these indirect impacts could also happen pretty quickly within days or weeks or months or years. So we have seen a lot of damage to the health system in many of the conflicts. Um, many of the hospitals get attacked and damaged. We have seen rise of infectious diseases and in uh, armed conflict situations, malnutrition, food insecurity, a deficiency of water, sanitation, hygiene, uh, impact on maternal child health, chronic illness and NCDs on the rise, long-term mental health consequences, environmental degradation. So these are just a list, but they're actually more than that. And then when we think about long-term, and by long-term, I'm talking about even after the conflict is over, there's still gonna be negative public health consequences for years and years after that. Intergenerational trauma, uh, economic and social health disparities, chronic disease and disability, and a reduction in life expectancy, which is one of the most important kind of health indicators that we care about. Um, in Syria, where the civil war began in 2011, and it's still going on, 
one year before the war started in 2010, life expectancy in Syria was 74 years. And in five years later, well, four years after the war in 2011, life expectancy in Syria went down to 55. So, I mean, this is a very obvious um, case that uh, there are long-term impacts of armed conflict on health of populations. I came across, as an infectious disease uh, epidemiologist, I was interested in what do we know about how conflict is impacting infectious disease? And um, I came across, this was the first kind of a systematic literature review that I came across, and it was published just a few months ago um, in the journal Conflict and Health. And um, this systematic review literature was actually uh, funded by European CDC. It was kind of interesting to me that they're doing this. And again, it was for the first time, published just in 2024. And when I look through this, um, what they said is they looked at all the um, published papers from 2000 to 2023, where um, the focus of the publication was on rise of infectious disease in conflict setting. And they kept it open, the conflict settings in Europe, Middle East, Asia, and Africa. And they only found 51 studies that documented this rise of infectious disease. And as you can see, there's quite a few of these, uh, cholera, COVID-19, HIV, HPV, tuberculosis, Ebola, malaria, et cetera. And you can see the numbers. So for example, cholera, there was 11 studies, which was useful, but 11 doesn't always give us all the information we need. And as you can see, some of the other um, infectious disease on the right side, for example, malaria, how conflict impacts malaria they only found two studies that had actually documented that. And you can see diphtheria, dengue, just one study. So yes, there is some research out there, but there's still a lot more needs to be done to understand how infectious diseases um, go up at the time of conflict. And this is what the key factors uh, they came up with in the systematic review. These are the reasons we see a rise of infectious disease in conflict zones. First, population displacement. That's a huge issue. Destruction of the vital infrastructure, reduction in functioning of the healthcare system and healthcare personnel. Some of them pass away, some of them are injured, some of them leave the country. Disruption of disease control program. Surveillance goes down or gets uh, abolished. Diagnostic um, delays, interrupted vaccination, reduced access of healthcare providers to population and a disruption in supply of a chain of um, safe water, food, and medication. So obviously handling these situation is gonna be quite complicated uh, and there's a lot work needs to be done. And then they came up with sort of, how do we mitigate uh, these infectious disease risk in conflict situation? And this is what the systematic review uh, came up with. Uh, of course, we need some disease-specific intervention strategy, whether it's tuberculosis, whether it's polio, et cetera. Education, they mention a lot of the people in, in these conflict-affected populations may not be aware of the risk that they're at, especially when they're moving from their homes to you know, a, a camp or some other place that they have never been at. Um, a lot of investment uh, in healthcare locations, uh, definitely, we need a lot of immunization campaigns that needs to happen. It was interesting. They also put ensuring political commitment, whether it's in the country or globally, to deal with this situation. And a lot of intersectoral collaboration between governments and international organizations. So that's what the systematic review uh, came up with. So as I mentioned to you, I've been thinking about what is the role of public health academician? That's what I am. I'm a faculty member. I'm not a humanitarian um, you know, organization member. I'm not a policymaker. I'm a public health academician. What is it that I can do? And this goes back over 10 years ago where frankly in our school of public health, there wasn't any course, there wasn't any training, there weren't in any faculty that were focusing on this sort of crisis situation, particularly armed conflict. So I started reaching out to academicians that I came across at multiple universities, schools of public health, that had a particular 
program initiative, uh, a full center on this topic at Harvard, Hopkins, Columbia, University of Washington, and a few others. And I reached out to them and I must say they were quite um, nice. They were, they were uh, talked to me and they even send me like uh, some literature, their syllabus, et cetera, which was very helpful to me. I had a sabbatical year in 2013. And because I come from the Middle East region, I decided to go to the Middle East. And I had some connection with colleagues at American University of Beirut in Lebanon. And I went there and I met with the faculty of health sciences. And also I met a lot of nonprofit organizations, both local and international, who were working with refugees in um, Lebanon itself. When I came back, one of the things that came up to me is, Kabe, you could develop a course. There's no course on this topic. Develop a course. That's not going to cost money. It's just your effort. Put a course together. You will learn, and hopefully your students will learn from you. And that's exactly what I did. And also, I began to do some collaborative research on specific on health of populations, mostly in the Middle East region, because that was where my connection was. So this is a kind of a, a slide which explains some of my early research on health of populations affected by humanitarian crisis. Because I had HIV AIDS background, I kind of brought it into a humanitarian crisis situation. And I managed to do some projects in um, Lebanon, but also I worked with colleagues who had been working in Northeast Uganda, which is also a conflict zone. I did a project called Verbal Autopsy in Northwest Syria, which I'm assuming some of you may not have ever heard about it. I hadn't heard about it when I uh, got started with this project. Uh, during COVID, in the beginning uh, year of COVID, I had colleagues in Somalia who reached out to us with um, requests for support, and I was able to support them with some of our students remotely on collecting data on what was happening with COVID-19. Cancer care came up multiple times it was not my expertise, but again, I met with some people who had this expertise and tried to do something about a uh, cancer situation among displaced population. Substance use, mental health of forced migrants, something I have worked on. And as you can imagine, if you're conducting research with this highly vulnerable populations, refugees, displaced population, you really need to pay a lot of attention to the ethical aspects of your research. And that's definitely something that I care about and I've been uh, spending a lot of time on. So in terms of HIV AIDS in the context of humanitarian crisis, as I mentioned, I did a bunch of projects in Lebanon and Northeast Uganda. Um, there are some published papers, I'm listing some of them here. Um, the particular focus was, as you may know, in Lebanon, which is a small country of about 6 million people, when the war in the neighboring country of Syria happened, well over a million Syrians were forced to come into Lebanon. So out of every four people in Lebanon, one of them was a refugee, which was obviously extremely uh, difficult for the Lebanese government, which also doesn't have much um, of, uh, you know, funds and etc. They had a hard time taking care of their own people, and now they had to take care of a lot of refugees. And there, we didn't come across studies that looked at substance use and HIV in uh, Lebanon. And in conversation with local uh, colleagues at the American University of uh, Beirut and, and nonprofit organizations, we asked them how we can support you. And we ended up doing a couple of projects. And uh, to I think I would say to some extent, the projects were useful. Um, it, of course, it didn't solve the problem, but it, it was useful to our um, colleagues. And these are a couple of the uh, published papers on what was happening in uh, Northeast Uganda, which again has been going through a conflict situation for many years. And um, it has resulted on a lot of uh, issues, including uh, transactional sex work has gone up, which of course increases risk for HIV. Some of the, we see a lot of uh, kind of intimate partner violence uh, in the region. So the violence, it's mostly men that are exposed to violence outside, unfortunately they bring the violence sometimes inside their homes and their alcohol use goes up 
substance use, etc. So these were some of the first ever uh, papers published for, on these topics in this particular region. And as I said before, um, these are very sensitive topics. And I recall when uh, we finished the study, my colleague, uh, the first author, Jennifer Moots, who was a postdoc at the time, she reached out to me and said, Kave, um, how are we going to disseminate this information? I am a little bit worried about uh, by disseminating it to the wrong people, it may actually bring harm to the participants. And she and I did a lot of work. Um, she looked for, to see if there was any guidelines on how to do these kinds of dissemination. And frankly, there was none. There was no specific guidelines of how do you disseminate research findings on these sensitive topics. So we ended up actually, I went to uh, Northeast Uganda with her and we ended up working with some nonprofit organizations and we kind of developed a whole workshop and figuring out how to disseminate the findings. And I told uh, Jennifer Moots, I said, what you did, it's really important. And as you said, there isn't clear guidelines, put it out there. And she kind of published this paper, which I'm hoping it will be useful for other people who are doing similar projects in different uh, contexts. The second project I wanna tell you a little bit about is Verbal Autopsy Project in Northwest Syria. Again, I should uh, be honest with you and tell you no, uh, Verbal Autopsy was a new project for me, which I didn't really have expertise in. Um, this really goes to the fact that a lot of the debts in globally are not actually registered. So if you look at the uh, WHO website, what they say is about 40% of all the deaths in the world are actually not registered because people don't have access to hospitals. They don't, you know, that's not where they pass away. They may pass away in their own home and they get buried and their death and cause of death is never registered. And of course, this has become a major issue in low middle income countries. And there's only about 8% of deaths in low middle income countries that have a clear documented uh, causes. So we know why people have died in these low middle income countries, only 8%. So we know that um, knowing the cause of death, number of deaths and cause of death is absolutely an important uh, data point that we need as uh, public health people, but also decision makers to figure out what is causing mortality in this population to be able to come up with a public health initiative. So what WHO had done a few years ago, they came up with this idea. Um, they developed an instrument called a verbal autopsy, which is basically uh, basically like a survey. It's a very uh, carefully done survey where you train community health workers in the region where deaths are not registered and cause of death is not known. You train the community health workers to go through this very extensive uh, survey then they go, well, they have to build a very good relationship with the community that have lost loved ones. They go and literally go inside the doors or uh, camps and they ask people, would you be willing to tell us if one of your loved ones has passed away over the last six months or a year? And if they say yes, you kind of ask them very specific questions about what was uh, some of the symptoms, well, who was taking care of this person? What were the causes of, um, what are the seminars, uh, what, what were some of the symptoms they had? Um, did they have some kind of a major problem even before this situation, et cetera? So they ask a lot of questions, complete this uh, survey, and then data is analyzed. And actually right now, AI is being used a lot uh, for this. And based on all that information that you analyze, you could actually come up with a pretty accurate cause of death data. So verbal autopsy is really an important tool in areas where number of deaths and cause of death are not known. Now, when I say Northwest Syria, uh, some of you may know that Northwest Syria is a region of Syria where um, it's still considered a conflict zone. Uh, the government is not in charge of that area. Mostly the Turkish government is uh, in involved in that region. There's almost 5 million people living in Northwest Syria and 3.5 million were internally displaced. So they moved from other regions of Syria in the Northwest. 
this idea, this uh, project, verbal autopsy project, was led by my colleague, Dr. Mahmoud Hariri. He is a Syrian uh, trauma surgeon. He went to Aleppo University in Syria as a faculty of medicine. He, of course, um, went through a lot of trouble. He left the country and he was able to go at Harvard University and become what's known as scholar at risk. And then I had the opportunity to meet with him. He came down to Yale um, to, to give some talks and I developed a collaboration with him, support. And he told me that he has developed a nonprofit organization called HIS Unit, Health Information System Unit. He really cared about Docu you know, careful documentation of deaths and causes of death. That's what he wanted to do. And he asked us if we can support him. And he mentioned verbal autopsy. And I said, well, <laughs> we're happy to support you, but that is not a topic I have ever heard about, but I will do my best to learn and I will try to bring some students that may be interested in working with you. And that's exactly what we did. Um, we have been working on this project for a couple of years now. We, we were able to secure some funds for them, uh, vital strategies, um, gave them some uh, funds, and they're continuing to do this verbal autopsy project. And what they have accomplished so far is they these community health workers in Northwest Syria have already conducted over 1,000 surveys. So now data is being analyzed to figure out exactly what are the causes of death in this uh, conflict zone. So that, I think, has been a very impactful project as well. Um, the two of my students who got involved in this project, they were really horrified that the number of deaths and the you know, causes of death are missing in many parts of the world. And they developed their own nonprofit organization called Make Deaths Count, which, you, you know, of course, you can access it if you like. And I want to give credit to them. And these are the, the two team members who supported my colleague in Northwest Syria, but also developed this Make Deaths Count um, nonprofit. Ahmad and Ihsan, they finished their MPH, and now they're uh, continuing to, to work in, uh, in Syria, but also they're working with some colleagues in Somalia and a couple other countries to, again, support them to register the number of deaths and causes of death. All right, so the last part, I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about the Humanitarian Research Lab. As I mentioned to you, I launched it in 2021. I had been wanting to do this for a long time, but frankly, I was a bit uncomfortable. I didn't know whether our school will support us for a project like this. But thankfully, um, I have received some support uh, from our own school, but also at our own institution. So the big mission for the lab is to support humanitarian organization that actually provide services, but also policymakers that are uh, addressing humanitarian crisis. So the two broad objectives, one, conduct collaborative research on health of populations that are affected by crises, collaborate with nonprofit organizations, humanitarian organizations, et cetera, to support them to do evidence-based work. And the second objective, uh, is producing evidence for human rights violations during armed conflict. This is a new project. This is a new topic for me, but I had the pleasure of meeting my colleagues who had been working on human rights violations for decades. So these are my two colleagues, Nathaniel Raymond and uh, Dr. Danny Poole. Uh, Nathaniel Raymond was at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative over 20 years ago, and he had been working on analyzing satellite imagery data to document attacks um, in South Sudan. And at the time, Danny Poole was also working with Nathaniel on this project. So now they're both at our School of Public Health. Nathaniel is the executive director of my lab, and he's a lecturer at our, at our um, department. And Danny Poole is also a, a new faculty member in our department. So when the war in Ukraine happened in 2022, for the first time ever, the US State Department launched a project that they called Conflict Observatory Project. And the aim of the project on the left side is to capture and analyze evidence of war crimes and other atrocities allegedly perpetrated by Russia and Ukraine. So they wanted to make sure Russia is held accountable for war crimes. 
if they're destroying hospitals, if they're destroying destroying um, schools, etc., these are war crimes. You're not allowed to do that. So they wanted to make sure that there are people who have um, particular expertise in making these documentation. And then a new war started in Sudan in April 2023, and State Department was also interested in documenting what's happening in Sudan. So they added another project on conflict observatory in Sudan, again, to document humanitarian and human security impacts due to conflict. So my team was involved in both of these projects. Right now, we are um, finishing this project. Actually, uh, unfortunately, it is very likely that by December, uh, this project will go away, but we'll see what happens. So the way our team works is they actually use a lot of open source data. So these are data, for example, generated by survivors, um, eyewitnesses, perpetrators, and they put it on like social media. There's all of, lots of public records. There is, uh, you can get some access to data, for example, in Facebook, et cetera, social media. And we definitely try to do verification of what's happening on the ground. And the other major source of data for us is satellite imagery. There's commercial satellite imagery available. It's actually, for some people, it's free. You can get access to it, analyze it, but you need to have expertise in geospatial analysis. But for us, we needed to get very um, sort of high level uh, resolution satellite imagery. And we were able to uh, secure some of those and analyze them. And we brought both of these together, sort of open source data, satellite imagery to document attacks. So in the last two and a half years, we have humanitarian research lab, HRL. We have um, put out 44 reports the first 12 were all about Ukraine, and now we are doing more and more reports on what's happening in Sudan. And these are some examples of the topics that we have been covering. First month, attacks on healthcare facilities and schools by Russia's forces in Ukraine. Um, filtration system, uh, campaign of extrajudicial detention, disappearances, damage assessment to Ukraine's crop storage. You're also able to see mass graves from you know uh, remote from satellite imagery, we could see whether the graves are expanding. And unfortunately, this was happening both in Ukraine and Sudan. I'm highlighting two of these reports because frankly, these two reports, for reasons that I don't fully understand, have been most impactful. The one in Ukraine, we released a report which documented that Russia has a, has a systematic program that is basically deporting, transferring Ukrainian children into Russia. And basically they were trying to make them Russian. This is clearly a war crime. You're not allowed to take students, as a, sorry, to take children from one country to another. And then the second one was, uh, we released a report when early on when the um, war in Sudan started and the State Department actually went to Saudi Arabia and brought the armed groups from Sudan to have some kind of a peace negotiation. And State Department asked us to send them the report right away because they wanted to see the documentation of attacks to bring out to the armed groups to make sure that they are they know that the um, State Department is aware of them. So the children investigation, uh, we, demonstrated, we showed that over 6,000 Ukrainian children have been taken into Russian custody. We, we were able to document the facilities they're in. So we found a lot of information, released the report. And about one month after this um, report was released, the president of International Criminal Court announced indictment of Russia's president, Vladimir Putin, but also uh, Maria Lavova Bolova was the woman that you just saw, who is the sort of child rights commissioner. And she's the one who's been actively bringing the um, Ukrainian children. And by the way, the Russians said they were not hiding this. They said, oh, we, we, we are helping them. We are, we are providing support for these uh, young children and we want to make them Russian. But again, this is a clearly a human rights violation and International Criminal Court announced the indictment for Putin for the first time. In terms of Sudan Conflict Observatory, um, as I said, it began in 2023. 
Uh, we are releasing a lot of reports about early warning, humanitarian impact assessment. I mentioned there was a peace negotiation in Jeddah in, in Saudi Arabia, and they used our document as doc as evidence of atrocities. And there is a lot going on in uh, Darfur region right now. There's there's a lot of flooding. There's a lot of um, inability of access to food, etc. So there's a lot going on in Sudan, and my team is really very much focused on that. In terms of supporting humanitarian organization, I'm sure most of you know about MSF, Doctors Without Borders. They reached out to us about their project in Sudan with very specific question that honestly I had never, this is something I have never experienced. They wanted us to give them these three data sources. They said, we know that you have access to these data. You do a lot of satellite imagery analysis. Could you please tell us what's the population estimation in Zamzam, this region in Sudan that's gone through a lot of conflict? What are the expanding grave sites? What's the damage assessment in El Fasher? So they really asked very specific uh, questions with data. And we were able to say, we said, of course, we can give you this data. And within days, we were able to give them the data. And they needed that information to figure out how they're going to provide services and where. In terms of, so this is, we've been talking about research, but I'm also going to talk about policy advocacy. And by that, I'm talking about providing evidence. There are two sort of groups that come to mind. One is journalists, which honestly, I haven't really been that engaged with journalists a little bit here and there, but now we are having constant communication with journalists. Actually, I just talked to CBS this morning. And also we're providing a lot of evidence for humanitarian organizations that are responsible for war crime accountability. So just to give you an example of a journalist uh, from Reuters, uh, the email that they send us, the email subject was very specific, as you can see, request for data on El Fasher attacks and Zamzam flooding. And as you can see, they mentioned they had seen our reports because our, uh, our reports are uh, released publicly. Everybody can have access to them. They said that they have seen our reports, they've seen the maps, and now they're asking very specific questions about georeference data on attacks around El Fasher since January 2024, flooding that affected Zamzam. And they said, if you're open to sharing this data, we will, of course, properly credit the, uh, the source according to your preference. And again, we said, absolutely. We want this information to get out there. So we've been uh, working with writers as well. In terms of working with organization responsible for war crime accountability, Mostly, we are in conversation with International Criminal Court. They ask us for data on Ukraine and Sudan, and we've been providing them. We also work with some non-governmental organizations that are focused on this topic, like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and many more. All right, getting close to the end. So what is it that we can do as public health academician in response to armed conflict? Well, these are some of the concrete things that I've come up with that we are doing, and I think others can do as well, we certainly can document and measure the health impacts of armed conflict that is not obviously available. Uh, we should be collaborating with humanitarian organizations that are actually providing support uh, to people affected by conflict and support them to develop evidence-based intervention. The third one is providing evidence for war crime accountability. Again, it's something that was very new to me, but I understand the importance of it. And of course, we can do a lot of education and training capacity building in our own community, but also uh, beyond our communities. And there's much, much more that we can do and we should do. But these are some of the concrete things that I came up with that I'd like to share with you. So the final takeaway is I certainly recognize as public health academicians we don't have the power, we don't have the expertise to actually directly end conflict, but that doesn't mean that there's nothing we can do. We must recognize that armed conflict is an urgent public health issue, and we need to be taking some active roles by ideally preventing conflict or mitigating its health impact. So that's sort of the takeaway from my presentation. And I'll just end by um, showing you the there is a website um, on our humanitarian research lab, and you can have access to reports right now 
the only reports you can have access to are uh, Sudan reports, but um, the State Department has a conflict observatory hub and you can access all the reports uh, on Ukraine as well. Uh, thank you very much. Let me open up here. I'm open to any questions you may have. Maybe you can raise your hand or. There is a question in the chat, Dr. Kushnu, huh? from Jibril. It says, how humanitarian curriculum in public health or in global health prioritized in, in your public health curriculum? And then there's a second question right under that, if you can see it. Excellent. I see that. Great question. Honestly, that's something I've been uh, focusing on a lot. Unfortunately, to my knowledge, schools of public health have no requirement to have some sort of a course, some kind of a teaching training on this topic. Uh, it's not a requirement. So um, I am teaching a course called Health in Humanitarian Crisis. I teach it in the spring. And that's a new course. It's a course that, of course, I would have liked to benefit from, but um, it doesn't exist. I've actually been telling my students, by the way, you're in welcome to do the same thing, to do like a survey of uh, schools of public health, maybe the top 20, 30 schools of public health, and basically ask them if they have any kind of a course, uh, teaching, training, webinars, anything on this topic. Um, and I really think we need to um, basically push them a bit that don't ignore this topic. This is something that at a minimum, our students should learn something about them. And by the way, some of the students that have uh, completed my course have moved to their sort of career as um, working for USAID, um, working for WHO or some UN agencies that do humanitarian work, et cetera, which I'm very proud of them uh, to do that. Um, what resource, okay. Uh, Kilia, do you want to mention your for the past year if you have seen examples? Yeah, I mean, this issue, I definitely bring it up. Why is it that, uh, honestly, the leadership in many schools of public health don't pay much attention to this topic? Obviously, armed conflict is a major political issue. I recognize that it's obvious, but... There are many, many public health issues. I would say just about all public health issues that also have a, a policy, you know, political aspect to it, right? Think of gun violence. Um, I was just mentioning that uh, to Lauren uh, that our new dean is the first person who has a particular focus on reducing gun violence in the United States. For years and years and years, many schools of public health ignored this topic. Thankfully, I am seeing a rise in focusing attention to this. Clearly, it's a highly political issue, but thanks to journalists, thanks to researchers, advocates, um, gun violence has finally become recognized as a public health issue, and a number of schools of public health are focusing on that, and I heard that your school is also doing that, so that's great. And as I said, in terms of armed conflict, we're not going to end it. We're not going to be able to, you know, uh, even pause it in any way. But there's a lot that we can do to support organizations that have those responsibility. And that's, yes, that's, I, I taught that course. I was a lecturer at McGill course. By the way, this issue of peace comes up a lot. I'm sure you heard this over and over again from many public health leaders, including the, the leader of WHO, who, who has used this statement that there's no health without peace and there's no peace without health. We have heard this kind of a statement on and on from many different public health leaders. But again, peace, peace studies, peace education, peace development, these are not just a minor thing. This is a big topic. And again, as schools of public health, I don't believe we have any requirement to teach this. I know that there's a number of schools that have a master's degree or even a PhD degree for peace and global affairs. Just recently, they finally 
uh, raise this peace, I think I don't call it peace studies program. And we are going to be collaborating with them because I think what they're going to be teaching the students is also important for public health people. To your knowledge, are there public health efforts of research on war crimes in conflict in Israel? Um, not much, but actually, um, by the way, as you can imagine, the State Department was not interested in supporting us to look at what's happening uh, in the war in Israel and Gaza. But some of my colleagues actually volunteered and they did the same thing they had done in Ukraine and Sudan. They found access to um, open source data, some satellite commercially available satellite imagery data. And actually Danny Poole, the person that I mentioned to you, she published a study which was about documenting uh, attacks on hospitals in Gaza. And that was published. By the way, the... <laughs> The British medical journal that was uh, publishing this, they really pushed back on this many, many times, but finally it, it did get published. So yes, I have seen a couple of publication on what's happening in Gaza, but honestly, not that much. That's, I have not seen um, the amount of work. And you speak to what a public health viewpoint brings to the work. Great question. Um, I had the pleasure of going to a university for peace in Costa Rica. I don't know if any of you have heard about this. Uh, as you may know, Costa Rica is one of the only countries that decided decades ago not to have military. Of course, they have um, police officers. They have, But they decided we don't need a military. And to my knowledge, that's the only country in the world. So because of that, United Nations helped develop a university called University for Peace in Costa Rica. And actually, years ago, one of their faculty in that school was teaching a course on sort of human rights issue related to HIV AIDS. Then they came across my name and they approached me. They said, could you bring public health perspective into HIV AIDS? Because we're only talking about from a kind of a human rights uh, aspect. And I had never done something like this, but I said, sure. I went to Costa Rica and we ended up co-teaching. And honestly, I learned a lot from them. And I think they also learned from public health because they had a really tough time um, when they were thinking about decisions. For example, should everyone mandatorily be tested for HIV? Many of them would say yes, um, which... It's actually not the right thing to do. Uh, should every pregnant woman be forced to be tested for HIV, et cetera? They didn't really know the public health aspect of uh, HIV transmission, what's reasonable, what's not. So I think it's definitely useful to bring uh, those who have expertise in peace studies and public health together. In fact, I have multiple times told my colleagues at the University of Peace, if you want to develop a co-develop a course where you bring your perspective, we bring our perspective, and we can even provide it remote remote to, I don't know, in Coursera or something. So anybody can have access to it. So that is something that I think would be important um, because I don't expect schools of public health to develop a lot of courses on peace education, peace studies, but Maybe some will. And by the way, I'm just going to do like one. I'm bringing a expert on this to my course, Health and Humanitarian Crisis, towards the end of the class, because I want them to bring their expertise uh, to our students. Any other questions? By the way, is this completely a new topic for you or, or some of you have read about this? Uh, I'm curious to know, uh, 
have become, I, I mean, as I said, there are now journals like Conflict and Health Journal. There are a the number of journals that are focusing on this topic, which I think that's really important. Um, I don't know whether any of you had, you know, access to those and read through them, uh, but there is, thankfully, there is beginning to be more and more evidence on this topic, uh, but still, there's a lot, lot more to do. Um, so I'm hoping that, again, a good number of schools of public health in the United States and, and beyond pay attention to this topic. Intervention is a cool one on mental health and conflict. Absolutely. Mental health, as you can imagine, has come up over and over and over again. And um, by the way, even some of the refugees that are resettled in the United States, in New Haven, we have a refugee resettlement program that goes back to 40 years. I think they brought refugees from Cambodia, et cetera. Now they're bringing refugees uh, mostly from Afghanistan, from Ukraine, uh, from Sudan, from Syria, uh, Iraq, et cetera. And I have served on their board of directors for 10 years. A mental health issue of these resettled refugees has come up multiple times. Yes, they're in a relatively safe place in New Haven. They're no longer in Afghanistan or in Ukraine or Sudan, but what they've gone through has definitely impacted their mental health. And many of them are students struggling. And unfortunately, what I found is that they have very limited access to therapy sessions. For example, I was talking to one of them about a, a child who had been really injured in Syria and he really needed a lot of mental health support. And they said, unfortunately, we can only give give this person three sessions. Like that's the only funds that we have available. Uh, and I'm trying to get, we have a, so many psychiatrists and psychologists at Yale, and a number of them are getting very involved in refugee mental health. And I'm very pleased because they they can offer a lot of support um, so yeah, mental health is definitely become a major, major issue, which is also going to impact even other problems. I mean, if you're dealing with some chronic illness, but your mental health, you're so distressed, et cetera, you may not be even to even, you know, even if you have access to your treatment, you may not be able to take your medication, et cetera, because you're just, your mind is not clear. Um, so yeah. I see uh, I'm a first year nursing PhD student interested in doing this type of work. Wonderful. Yeah, I think uh, not just public health people, but um, nursing uh, students, um, um, medical people definitely have lots and lots to contribute to this. Uh, I agree with that. It's not just a public health thing, but we do have some experience and expertise that we can bring into this topic, which Hopefully, by listening to me, you, you agree with this statement. So if there are no more questions, we can wrap it up. Um, let me... Um, I do want to thank you, Kame, for the amount of labor um, that you put in to teach us today. This is fascinating. I know I was kind of blown away about the statistics about um, death not being counted, right? That was um, jarring and um, sobering. Um, what I will say is that this is, a, again, an ongoing conversation um, that will continue to make space for and are there ways that folks can reach out to you or do you uh, feel? Uh, yes. I mean, I, I've, as we, I certainly, there's a number of public health students in our own institutions that are working with me right now, but I've, I've had a few uh, public health students from multiple uh, institutions reach out to me. If there's something specific that I can help you, definitely feel free to reach out or I may be able to connect you with, depending on your topic of interest, the population of interest, or um, I may be able to connect you with, with people who, who could be useful to you. Sure. Amazing. My email, my email is just my name. You can look it up 
Yeah, it was really easy to find on the um, Yale SPH website. So I do encourage folks to look that up. Um, and so I want to thank you all for joining us today. We do ask that everyone fill out an evaluation of our event so we continue to grow and um, offer events that make sense for our community. Um, and then we have a couple of links to upcoming events. The next Justice in Public Health event is coming up on December 4th. We're going to be talking about pet ownership as it relates to anti-racism. Um, and then I am a keynote speaker um, for our Health Professional Student Leadership Conference coming up on Saturday. And so folks can come to that for free if they're interested. Um, students at um, UMN are welcome to come. So again, thank you all for coming. We look forward to seeing you at our next Justice in Public Health event. And I hope that you all have a fantastic rest of your day. Take care. Thank you so much, everybody. Take thank care. You all. Mm -hmm. Bye.